Hello, hello. And welcome again to a Beatles program, a talk show podcast that is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about any subject that comes to mind with the Beatles. It could be about their past, present, or even the future, their music, their history, you name it. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three co-hosts of the show, also known for my weekly syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. Being joined by, first of all, uh, one of the contributing writers for Billboard, also Variety Magazine, Goldmine, Access, AXS.com. He's also the author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, and that's our own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ken. Hello, Alan. Also, we have our resident musicologist who for many years worked in the classical department writing articles for the New York Times. And these days he's a freelance writer writing for the Wall Street Journal and lots of other publications, living in the state of Maine. And he's also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we have a very special guest that will join us here on the show. Many of you may know him as Ron Nasty. And he will be anything but nasty on our show. And that'll be in just a couple of minutes from now. But we just have uh, a little bit of news to get to. And we're going to start with the passing of one of the actors from A Hard Day's Night. And Steve, you want to talk about that? Uh, yes, uh, that would be um, Kenneth Haig, who played Simon Marshall uh, in A Hard Day's Night. Uh, I mean, if the name doesn't sound familiar, if the actor's name doesn't sound familiar, the lines from the scene with George Harrison will will you know will uh, will be recognized by everybody. I mean, it was one of the best scenes, if not probably the I don't know if you want to call it the the best the best solo Beatles scene in a hard day's night. I, I know a lot of people think that way. But it was just it it was just fantastic, and he was a he was a veteran actor. He he did other acting roles too. He was in, for example, he was in Cleopatra with Liz Taylor and Richard Burton. But he was just he was just fantastic as Simon, playing the the snobby guy uh, who thought uh, George Harrison was a was a quote quote uh, teenager, and he was trying to tell him about uh, their teenage um symbol. Teen- teenage symbol susan and uh george knew all about her and and the line uh you know that george said was uh, well we sit around and say rude things about it you know or turn something down like, like the sound and say rude turn down things. say rude things <laughs> right yeah there were just That's- so many great lines in that scene uh and you know his assistant p- nudging him, trying to get his attention, and uh, you know he wouldn't he wouldn't hear of it. And it was just, you know, the new thing is to care passionately and be right wing. I mean, just uh, it was just a spectacular scene, and uh, it's sad that uh, uh, that uh, he he passed away. He, he was uh, eighty six. He was not and credited other- for that scene. He he is not listed in the cast, so it's, a, it's sort of an uncredited appearance, apparently. Right. He also played an angry uh, the I believe it was the lead role of an angry young man on stage. Look back uh, in anger was the play. Or look back in anger. Thank you, thank you. But uh, yeah, I mean he was he was a he was a well known actor. I, didn't he also do Shakespeare? I mean it, he he looks like a Shakespearean actor type that he would you know that he would do that kind of thing. But he was just great. Um, he was just fantastic, and it was really sad to hear that he had passed. You mean that posh girl that gets everything wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, you can. There's so many lines from that scene yeah. that you can you can pull off, and it's just it, it's great that you know that that scene has lived on uh, outside of the movie, right? And also, there's the news, of course, that Yoko Ono celebrated her birthday, turning 85. Right. Elliot Mintz uh, posted uh, last night that he was at the party. He said he was going to post some pictures, but he has not. Uh, at least I haven't seen them yet. But uh, yeah, they had. A, I guess they had a little party at the Dakota for, and Elliot was there. Uh, so, happy birthday, Yoko! Yeah. yeah, and if Elliot posts photos and you're friends with us, we'll we'll share them so you can see them. Right. As well. There, so there was a, there was an interesting article, by the way, that I posted on my. Beatles page, um, Beatles News and Information about how positive Yoko has been, and has re- you know has uh, what a positive symbol Yoko has been, mm. and it's something that 
you know, people, especially those who criticize her, don't, uh, you know, kind of miss that uh, unlike many people these days who, you know, who are uh, in politics and who get involved in world issues tend to go negative, she has not. She's been incredibly positive. And it's, it's you know, you have to really give her a lot of credit for that. Uh, I mean, you know, this it's, it's she's basically following in John's footsteps, which is is a beautiful thing. When you consider all the hell she's had to deal with, mm-hmm. she's an inspiration, mm-hmm. and she really is in, in many ways. And I'm I'm not just saying that; I really do feel that way. Mm-hmm. To always be as positive as she does, as she is, giving positive messages constantly. Right. If you follow her Twitter account, you know all her messages are very are, are positive. Her her Facebook account's the same way. I mean, she posts the same thing between Twitter and Facebook. But yeah, her messages are extremely positive. So, right. and that's that's something we can use nowadays. Believe me. Mm-hmm. So. More positive people like that. Okay, and I just want to mention a couple more things here regarding the concert for George, which many of you know this Friday will be reissued on CD, DVD, and Blu-ray, and also for the first time ever on vinyl, also available as a limited edition box set. But uh, in addition to that, the uh, tremendous concert, wonderful emotional concert, will be shown in uh, limited screenings in theaters across North America. And if you'd like to see a listing of all the theaters that will be running it and when, you can go to the concert's website at concertforgeorge.com. And in addition to that, there'll be a one-hour radio special uh, concerning the concert for George with music from the concert and interviews with uh, many of the performers who were there that special evening. And if you'd like to hear it, if you listen to the live broadcast of my weekly Beatles show, Every Little Thing, which is on WNHU, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., that's Eastern Standard Time, uh, next week on the 28th of February, it's going to follow Every Little Thing at 9 p.m. So if you want to hear that special, and it's called Concert for George Revisited All Access, just tune in to WNHU.org. Next Wednesday night, again, that's the 28th, and that's at 9 p.m. following my show, Every Little Thing. All right, and we are very excited here at Things We Said Today because we have a very special guest to bring on to the program. Uh, Neil Innes, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you on our show on Things We Said Today. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, we should point out, first of all, before we talk, that Neil will be appearing at the Fest for Beatle Fans, which is at the Hyatt Regency, Jersey City on the Hudson, for the weekend of March 9th and 10th. And you can also catch him at two other shows on the East Coast right after that. He's playing at the Cutting Room in New York City on March the 13th, and also at the Vault, which is in Berlin, New Jersey, and that's on March the 14th. So, Neil... Uh, let's start by talking Ruddles here and go back to the very beginning because we know that the Ruddles started out being a sketch on Eric yes. Idle's uh, TV show, Rutland Weekend Television. Uh, oh, you right. worked on that TV show with Eric and you composed the music for the show, not just for the Ruddles. Was, is that your main contribution on that show? Absolutely. We were doing Monty Python shows at uh, Drury Lane in London when Eric said to me, do you fancy joining me on this television thing? And I remember I was saying to him, well, I don't, I'm not sure I like television all that much, Eric, you know, because we, we'd done uh, a show called Do Not Adjust Your Set with Michael Palin and Terry Jones and Terry Gilliam. Mm. And being in the Bonzos in those days, that we, ne- we were so anarchic, you know, we never did the same thing twice, so the cameras never knew where to point. So I pointed out that's why I didn't like television. And Eric said, well, you can tell the cameras where to point. Because uh, I said, well, this is different then. Because um, he was going to write sketches and things um, for this Rutland weekend television, which was the smallest TV station in Britain, allegedly. And... Um, and I was to do musical things and come up with the the ideas for the pictures. Mm-hmm. So the whole premise was that the TV shows were cheap and nasty <laughs> because they had no money. And uh, so I thought, well, what could be cheaper than a kind of a parody of A Hard Day's Night? It's black and white and speeded up and 
four blokes in tight trousers and sharp shoes running around a field. Yeah. So that, 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 that fitted, ticked all the budget boxes. So that's how it started. And he said, oh, great. Well, I've got a sketch about a documentary maker who's so boring, the camera runs away from him. And it all started from there, really. Right. Now, I've read that there was a chance that when you were going to do a parody that you were thinking of the Rolling Stones, too. No, people said, oh, now you've done the Beatles. Are you going to do the Rolling Stones? And a bit like Mick Jagger. I said, I hope not. You know, no. I think there's only one you could have done it with, and that is the Beatles, because things fell into place. You know, around that time, the first promoter in America was trying to get the, the Beatles back together again by offering them vast sums of money and a killer whale as a pet or something, <laughs> and, uh, and and on on Saturday Night Live, you know, they were running with the gag already. You know, they got right. George on, on there, and, and Lorne Michaels was waving $3,000 cash, which so happens to be four musicians' union rate for an appearance. Oh. You know? And there's a terrible acting going on, you know, so that all this is to be yours, George, just get the boys back together. And George is saying, what, all of this for me? And Lorne snatching it back and saying, well, no, you've got to share it with the others. Maybe you don't have to tell Ringo. You know? <laughs> these, these jokes were out there. <laughs> so it was easy enough for, you know, to, to, to take the clip from Rutland Weekend Television and feed it into this running gag. You know, because we got Eric Idle to host the show because he said he could get the Ruttles together for $300. Mm -hmm. and then they put it down to a bad phone line and said, oh, well, he hasn't got the Beatles, he's got the Ruttles. So they just showed it anyway. But the, what was so lovely was that everyone who, who watches Saturday Night Live enjoyed the joke and wrote in, you know, sort of saying, you know, get the Ruttles, we want to see them, bring the Ruttles back together, you know. So it suddenly uh, turned into this monster thing with a, a proper NBC budget, you know, to go and tell the whole story. And then right. Eric came up with a wonderful title, All You Need Is Cash. And, um, and so we started by pretending that the Beatles didn't exist, so it was always the Ruttles. Right. And I think it was a, a sweet little, you know, joke in a way, but it, it, everyone got it in the right spirit, I think. It was just so well done, that whole, that whole documentary, or mockumentary, as they say. But um, since it's said that, that you and Eric were the writers, did Eric pretty much stick to the sketches? Because I know you did the music, but did, the, did you also collaborate on the sketches themselves? Um, there was a lot of ad-libbing, you know, um, there were, because it was, I mean, Gary Weiss, uh, shot it all from on 16 millimeter, you know, from his shoulder, from his hip, you know, he, brilliant, you know, director, cameraman. And uh, so we're rushing from one setup to another. And well, I'm, I remember there was, um, when, when it came to do the scene in the bath, you know, with chastity, you know, they just turned the water on, you know, and I didn't know what I was going to say, you know, and Eric said, well, you're in a bath getting wet, you know, why? I thought, thanks, Eric, you know. Um, well, uh, we're, <laughs> we're in a bath getting wet, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, and, and then I hope that, you know, the, to, to, to point out, that's right, I think I came up with, it just popped into my head that basically civilization is an effective sewage system and we hope by the use of plumbing to demonstrate this to the world, you know. And uh, it, so much of it was ad-libbed. And, and John Halsey, you know, who played Barry Warm, he's one of the funniest men. And dear Ricky, bless him, you know, every time an apple fell on his head, he couldn't say, ouch, he just laughed. So <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Everybody had a lot of fun making that. Okay, I just want to ask you about a few of the ideas that were in the documentary before I pass you over to my co-host, but the running line about the trousers, it was all about the trousers. Who came up with that? Oh, that's Eric. Yeah. But you see, this is where George, George Harrison came in because he was, he was feeding in research that you couldn't find from anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was in a funny way, the Ruttles were kind of like an official biography of, of the Beatles, <laughs> but you know, all pretending it was that the Beatles didn't really exist. It was, it was just a fun 
game, I suppose, the kind of game that children play, like cowboys and Indians or, or you know, whatever they imagination in the playground they do. But we all felt like that. We felt like kids in a sandpit. Yeah. Well, George himself said that this was as close as you could get to the Beatles story and probably more accurate because it showed their sense of humor, which other documentaries didn't. No, in many ways. I mean, you've got to remember that, A, the Beatles were a fantastically tight rhythm and blues group, rock and roll, blue, Colin Monty Ron, but they, 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 they did the hard work. You know, they were a very, very tight band. But they also had, you know, brilliant sense of humor. They came from Liverpool. You know, Liverpool is the city of jokes, you know, wonderful. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I remember very fondly seeing them on television popping up every now and again, and it was always hysterical. You know? mm-hmm. That's part of their so, appeal. It wasn't just the music. No, I think absolutely. I, I don't think you can, you know, really define what the Beatles were. I, it's funny how I think all of us are much closer to the Beatles than we think, you know, because it isn't just the music. It is, it's the humour, it's the, the outlook and the hope <laughs> they had for a while, you know, that we could do something about the world. Okay. Since you mentioned Chastity, who came up with the idea of Instead of having a Japanese avant-garde artist, you had a German one that was a Nazi. <laughs> I mean, whose well, idea uh, was that? Well, it's all Eric. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. No, he 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 fashioned together, you know, kind of a storyboard, you know, with these various characters, and and I think it's just a. I think you, Yoko's birthday today, so we should be saying happy birthday, yeah, Yoko. That's true. Yes. yes. And um, but you know she got a lot of bad press you know because you know who is this woman you know breaking up the Beatles and um, but she's a sweetie and uh, and so it seemed funny you know to sort of um, drag out the old Nazi costume again for a hate figure you know but um, it, it, it you know that when we did all that it was a different world you know mm-hmm. mm. and we have much more. It's, it's got a little more, well, how can we put it? What a lot of weather we've been having lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have heard that Yoko did like the Ruddles, and she showed, you know, her sense of humor in doing so. Oh, yes, no, that was always lovely. We got, you know, uh, Eric said that you know, he bumped into Yoko, and Yoko was a Ruttle fan. And, of course, John was very, you know, supportive as well, because... Um, Ooh, people were saying, "Oh, these some of these songs are a bit close and things like that." And he sort of sent a message back saying he thought it's all fine, but the one he we might have trouble with would be "Get Up and Go," and so we left that off the album. Hmm. But uh, and also somebody told me that you know somebody bumped him into him in the street in New York City and said, "What do you think of the Ruttles?" And his response was to sing "Cheese and Onions." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we all have loads of questions, so I'm going to pass hey, go pass it along to Alan right now. Okay. Hi, Alan. Hello, Neil. <laughs> That's a really nice hat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, dear listener, yeah, it, the dear listener, it's a very kind of wintry, brackenish, yeah, reddy brown coat. Actually, the first time I wore it someplace, a friend of mine said, so what did the pimp say when you took the hat from him? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yes, we all get by with a little help from our friends, don't we? (laughs) Yeah. You know, the the Ruddles struck me, I think, at the time, um, because it – it came out around the time that the US TV was also showing Tony Palmer's All You Need Is Love. And it seemed yeah. in some ways almost a direct parody of that documentary. I mean, it seemed to follow the same trajectory, which I guess it would because it's the, based on the Beatles story. So, but, um, yeah. there, you know, there were certain, certain uh, you know, transitions that seemed, you know, almost the same. Was, did you guys have that in mind? Well, I, I think uh, you've got to remember Eric was a master at skewering uh, television mm-hmm. and, the, and the quiz shows and the, the general trend of it all. And so documentaries were all made the sort of same way. Tony Palmer sort of like uh, pushed the envelope a bit, mm-hmm. 
but that was the style in which things were made. And, and Gary Weiss didn't need any kind of instruction as to what to do. He'd been shooting these wonderful little cameos for Saturday Night Live. So with Eric's storyboard and, and the characters and, uh, and what have you, we, we slipped into that kind of style of documentary making, which, you know, which is 30 odd years ago, you know, which is, it's different to how it is now. Sure. But, um, but that, that, that's what you do in time, isn't it? You, 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 you use what's around you and that, that's how it comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, you've got, you've got to remember that Eric also came up with some wonderful bogus song titles. <laughs> I, I, I am the waitress, you know, <laughs> and, and, and your mother should go. Right, right. <laughs> I guess you couldn't actually write an I am the waitress one because you already had cheese and onions, which was sort of close to it. Well, exactly, exactly. Exactly. I think they're better sort of adding, you know, around the fringes. Yeah. But, um, it, it was, you know, I mean, I, I, I could see it coming in this meeting. I remember sitting on a windowsill in the Rockefeller Center in NBC, mm. and I thought, here they are all getting fired up and enthusiastic about doing the whole story. All you need is cash, yes, yeah, love it, we get, we get Bill Murray, we'll get, you know, whatever. And so then I thought, any minute now they're going to say, ooh, we're going to need some more songs. <laughs> <laughs> And then sure enough, you know, those, everyone started looking and said, do, do you reckon you could write 20 more Ruttle songs, you know, by next Thursday lunchtime? <laughs> I said, well, I'll try, you know. But I think I, I got a following wind, you know. And I, uh, I think I, so my intuition told me, don't listen to any Beatles songs. Mm. You know, try and remember where you were when a Beatles song you remember you know, because a lot of the script obviously had to be kind of the signposts of the the Beatles, you know, timeline. Sure. And uh, so, I mean, Eric came up with the brilliant title for for Ouch, you know, for help. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, it was. Everyone was piling in, you know. But I, I I decided that every song I'd need to be able to just play on a guitar by myself and see if it worked as a song. Uh, or the piano, you know, one or the other. Mm -hmm. And once I felt I'd done this, and I thought, well, now we can start listening to the Beatles records, you know. And that's that's when you sort of realise that that's where the real parody is, is in the copying of the production. Right. I don't know how many, you know, sort of hi-fi anoraks (laughs) are listening, but um, uh, Steve James, the engineer, decided you know to record it on at 30 inches per second on two inch tape i mean these the machine was sort of wobbling in the corner of the room like, like a drone about to take off you know mm. but and once we'd made the album we, we sat back listened to it and thought it's not quite right why and uh and we suddenly realized it sounds too good uh-huh. so we 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 actually had to compress it a bit by mixing it down on tape twice. And, and then you got close to the fact that, you know, they did record it, you know, with four track machines, you know, looped yeah. together and things like that. Uh-huh. So technically, we, we, we sort of, that's where the, the real observation went in. But in the songwriting, I just wanted to get the spirit of all, each song, you know. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. I think people, because they hear parody songs as kind of uh, a species of comedy more than a species Mm -hmm. of music in a way people don't i think really understand what an art musical parody is and you've been doing it since like way back in the bonzos i mean maybe before for all i know um what is it about the idea of of doing musical parody that that first appealed to you do can you remember how you got into doing parodies of of existing music well it's 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 kind of a, a little cart before the horse on this because in the bonzos we used to find these really old records uh, on 78s you know wind up gramophone stuff mm-hmm. because as students you know they were cheap they were pennies and we soon learned to look for a stupid title you know, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring a watermelon to my girl tonight. Right, I'll have that. <laughs> you know, hunting tigers out in India. You know, the stalkers brought a son and daughter to Mr. and Mrs. Mickey Mouse. What was odd, you know, because if you think about when these things came out in the twenties, you know, just after the First World War and the 
stock market crash of 28. It just shows you what a sense of humor people had, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, the, in the face of pretty, you know, grim things going on. And I think we all in the bond sales liked that kind of thing and, and saw the silliness of it and uh, wanted a part of it. But once it started, you know, I don't know, got bonds are just packed up and I found myself working with Python mm -hmm. and uh, and then right when we came, came along and I, and I it, it's one thing sort of led to another by, by doing the Beatles, that's how in, in a way I became a parodist it was, it was not on my kind of life's ambitions you know, not that I'm a very ambitious person but um, it was only because of these, these, the, the prefab four that I became a parodist because later on, uh, from the same producer as Rutland Weekend Television, liked the idea of putting music and pictures together, and that's when we had I had three series on BBC Two called the Innis Book of Records, and so that you know I thought well I'd already you know, I'd started a wonderful relationship with John Altman, the movie composer and arranger. And so we had a good team around us. And so we, we looked at all styles of music. And because, in a way, all styles of music have, you know, I mean, I'm with Duke Ellington. There are two kinds of music, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so all the styles, I, you know, anything that lights you up it, it is a fun thing. And I, I still like that kind of way. But I, I've never been kind of a solo artist with a, a voice of his own as it were you know because I, again i i love show business and all that kind of thing but it is very silly you know <laughs> and it attracts the track attracts the wrong kind of people it, it attracts too many people who just want to be famous i think there's a certain amount of art in in you know writing songs and making films and things and, and some get through <laughs> I think the uh, the Bonzos actually also did a, a parody of Give Peace a Chance at one point. Ah, oh, yes, it was a spontaneous thing. I mean, Legs Larry Smith, our drummer ah. and tap dancer, mm -hmm. uh, was notorious for sort of, um, he once did an interview for one of the music papers for advice for drummers. And he happened to be standing at a bar with a large brandy. And he said, advice for drummers? Plenty of this, he said, swilling the brandy, and, and never practice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, you know, he was very true to that creed. Uh, you know, Dennis Cowan and I used to be, you know, trying to hold it together while Larry would get tired and stand up and blow kisses to people. <laughs> so, um, the, the, you know, the, the mucking about has always been there, you know. Mm -hmm. So... So I think, I, if... I've lost my way a bit there. But, you know, oh, you yeah, know, no, we're back on the. Give, he was he who said, you know, a joke in the in the van. I said, all we are saying is give booze a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what um, we did when we did a tour of Ireland with the Nice, and yes, <laughs> yes, we were, were supporting the tour. The Bonzos were the sort of like silly sandwich, and the Nice. Anyway, we ended up in, in outside the city of Cork, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a sort of a, a trotting stadium where they race horses with, with with trailers or something and jockeys on them. Anyway, they, this was a bizarre thing, and they, they put a stage in the middle and wired it all up, but they only had a thirteen amp plug or something. So every time Keith Emerson switched on all these moogs and things, it all went fut. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the whole concert had to be abandoned. So we sort of said, well, let's all go down the pub then. And somebody actually got a, a very high angle photograph and there must be about at least three or 400 people outside the pub. And we started this impromptu version of all we are saying is give booze a chance <laughs> with, with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about light ales, brown ales, gin and tonic. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You mentioned um, the reactions of John and Yoko, and we, we know obviously that George was into this, seeing as he turned up in it. Um, w mm. Was there ever a response from Paul? He was, was treated a little harshly there, I think. Well, he was. I, I think, in fact, he did take exception to Eric's, you know, cameo <laughs> of him. And, um, but it, 
he's always been, you know, very cordial to me. You know, mm-hmm. he, he sort of, you know, he sort of gave me the nod. He said, you know, the, he sort of, he thought the music was affectionate. But uh, you know, I, it did. He didn't like it. He didn't like it. He didn't get it really. I don't think it. It, it was probably a little too close. You know, at a, at a time when a lot of people well, were, you know, were down on him. Well, it's it's uh, it's 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 a hard one to do uh, to to figure really, because um, yeah, no, he's had moments, you know, where he's been quite isolated in the scheme of things, mm. and um, but it's hell, it's it's his right. I think more it's to do with Eric's performance than the actual telling of the story and everything else, because right. George really wanted to wanted to do the Ruttles. Um, you know, he he wanted to put the beetle suit in the cupboard and move on. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, this was a good way of doing it. It was quite funny because he he came to a lot of the filming and whatnot. And we were sitting watching some of the day's rushes. You know, and uh, the song with a girl like you came up, mm-hmm. and uh, he leaned over. I was sitting in the row behind. He said, "That one's a bit close." <laughs> you know, I, I said, "Yes, George, it's close, but it's not the same." He said, "No, it's not the same, but it's still close." <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should pass you to Steve. Steve, thank you, Alan. Neil, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce all over the place. Um, I've been listening to the Bonzos and and Monty Python recently, and for some reason, I'm I'm coming up with a a link or not a link, but uh, a lot of similarities between Vivian Stanchel and Graham Chapman. Is there, to you, is there, how would you compare the role, the way the two um, had their roles in the respective groups? Ah, that's not a bad question because Graham Chapman writing with Cleese, you know, you couldn't, they, it was, you know, the, the necessary light and dark, positive and negative. Mm-hmm. I think I think the story goes with Cleese that he he first met Graham by seeing him in the street in Cambridge where they were both students, mm-hmm. and Graham was apparently we you know we have these pillar boxes in England where you post the letters, they're, they're, they're not like a, an American mailbox but they're they're quite big cast iron things, uh, round things with a slit in where you put the envelopes and. Graham was sort of bending down, peering into this, and winding an imaginary handle, <laughs> like one of, one of those seaside things where you can see a, a naughty lady taking off a dress or something. What the butler saw thing, mm-hmm. and so Cleese is walking along, all sort of eight foot nine of him, and he sees this rather strange character with a pipe, and uh, and, and so yes. The, the chemistry was there. I mean, I, I, if it can be summed up, what's that bit where they're dressed as friends of Mrs. Sartre or something, the, the women, and they just, <laughs> you know, and, and suddenly Graham says, Burma! You know, said, why did you say Burma? Sorry, I said, I, I panicked, you know. Um, it, it was just, it, it's just off the wall. And it, it was the same with Vivian, you know. He, he was a dangerous man. You never quite knew what was going to happen. So when he walked on stage or anything like that, you just, you know, he didn't disappoint. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, you know, the, the the wackiest things. I mean, they were, they were, I don't know how you describe it, sort of left of field, the art of the unexpected. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But they, 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 they certainly had that flair, you know. Yeah, you were talking about opening acts. Um, the Bonzos also opened for Cream. You remember that? Yes, yes. What was what was uh, that like? Oh, it's great. I mean, because everybody knew everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so I, mean, I didn't know Ginger very well. He's frightening man. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the because uh, the Bonzos wanted to sort of have fake amplifiers, you know, going to about twelve foot tall. <laughs> So we could move forward and pull them all down, like the sort of like the, the earthquake of Troy or whatever. So, but it was lovely when when the cream came off. You know, Jack Bruce, you know, they left with a great big cord ringing on and on and on. I said, "Oh, let's have a go from the wings." He said, "Yeah, you are." So I added to the cord and the wings on the bass. You know, so it, it, the lovely thing about the Bonzos was, it, you know, the, a lot of mainstream, very successful groups. 
were very jealous of us because we could muck about. You know, Eric Clapton said he's, he's always wanted to go on stage with a sort of parrot on his shoulder. You know, I said, yeah, but you can't, though, can you? You've got, a, you've got a poster of you with a perm that says Clapton is God. You know, get out of that. <laughs> how did, how did uh, Paul McCartney get involved with Urban Spaceman? Well, again, you know, he and Viv used to meet up. Um, quite regularly because Paul frequented a kind of a, a, a late night drinking club called the Speakeasy in Margaret <laughs> Street in London's West End and we had a manager who was our who was our producer as well record producer and um, he had a, a theory that no one spent more than three hours on a track the three hours on a track thing in fact on the first album Gorilla we decided to do a Dada track. You know, we'll do one take of something that was just on a 32-bar sequence in B-flat. And they swapped instruments. Rodney had never played the trombone and Viv had never played the trumpet. But we tapped it in and whatever it was, that's what we got. And that track is one of my favourites to this day. It's called Jazz Delicious Hot Disgusting Cold because it was just inept, but it was wonderful. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the so yes, we're talking about how how McCartney Viv, got involved, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, we Viv was down the speakeasy one night, and we 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 were told, you know, he was telling Paul that uh, of the problem of you know, we've got to make a single, we, the Bonzos are not and they weren't interested in making a single, you know. But we had to make a single, and uh, and the, the trouble was, that, you know, our manager was going to produce it, and uh, and he said, well, as we put it, he said, we just can't get the blighter off the knobs. <laughs> so, so Paul said, well, I'll produce it. He says, really? Yes, okay. So it was a wonderful moment, um, because in those days, I mean, Paul was Mr. Magic, mm -hmm. and. Um, so we went to our manager and said, OK, we'll do the single, but we don't want you to produce it. So the poor man said, oh, and who do you think you're going to get? And so we said, well, <laughs> we've, got, we've got Paul McCartney. And so Paul came down to the studio on the day. And we, we, I remember him coming in and saying hello to everybody and, and immediately going over to the grand piano saying, hey, I've just written this. And he sat down and he started playing Hey Jude. <laughs> you know, and no one had heard it before, and probably even the other Beatles hadn't heard it before. He probably had written it just that night before. So anyway, I thought for a while he was winding up our manager by wasting all this studio time by singing this dirge, you know. <laughs> but no, the session took eight and a half hours, and uh, it was wonderful because, uh, I don't know, do you want me to waffle on? There's some wonderful stories connected with the... With the with the session, we because, love Wonder uh, Sure, uh, 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 yeah. Go ahead, go ahead and tell. Go ahead and tell. Us. All right. Well, well, Viv was left-handed, and so is Paul. So Paul picked up Viv's ukulele and started playing that. Uh, not on Urban Spaceman. That's Paul playing the ukulele, and um, a bit Nashville style, sort of leaning into the microphone, coming out again. You know, and then it's so funny because um, the manager's wife never came to you know, recording sessions normally. But because Paul was there, she turned up. <laughs> and so, And she was a very, very English woman. You know, she'd been to Oxford. And so she went up to Paul, who'd got Viv's ukulele, and said, oh, what's that you've got there? Is it a poor man's violin? And quick as a flash, Paul said, no, it's a rich man's ukulele. You know? <laughs> Anyway, you know, Viv wanted to put on his, he's got a sort of length of garden hose with a trumpet mouthpiece and a plastic funnel. He used to wear it around his head. And he wanted, I'd, I'd rather like to record this. And so said, Paul said, yeah, okay. And the engineer said, you can't record that. And Paul said, yes, you can. Just put a microphone in each corner. <laughs> so there you know, we've got this, this circular go hard host by trumpet thing on the end and, uh, and of course finally it's done and uh, and then we saved the sort of because the manager was obviously thinking well at least we've got Paul McCartney's name on the record <laughs> so that's when we hit him with the whammy and said we don't want Paul's name on the record for heaven's sake we don't want success on someone else's coattails you know and the poor man was nearly in tears and said well what are you going to call him then 
And somebody said, well, how about Apollo Sea Vermouth? And Paul said, yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, was the intro and the outro all improvised? Yes. Yeah, uh, with a certain amount of planning, though. Because it, <laughs> it was done on, um, on four-track, one-inch four-track. So you can imagine, so three tracks would be recorded on and then they would be bounced as it were to one track that would leave you more tracks and you put two more and then you bounce the next three down leaving one track spare and so on and it was just built up by dubbing from one thing to another and um yeah it probably did take about two and a half hours <laughs> i love the i love the in jokes on that song i mean a lot of them obviously are are you know are for that time but still they're they're really funny that's a, a brilliant piece of it's a brilliant piece of music. Well, Viv, Viv's got this wonderful authority in his voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think well, he can say any amount of rubbish. And, uh, and, and, and it's quite nice because uh, an authority voice talking rubbish. Well, we've all become used to it now. <laughs> but, really? uh, uh, you know, but th at the time, it, it was kind of a BBC voice, you know, to, right. uh, looking you know, and so and so, and he's just a constant entertainer, and uh, it's and again that's one of my favourite tracks as well. Um, we didn't hear much about Grimm's here in America, which had you and Mike McCartney and and Roger Mago in it. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about them? Well, the Grimm's name comes from surnames: uh, Gorman, Roberts, Innes, McGough, McGear, and Stanshaw. Huh. So that that was the idea, you know, of a mixture of things. But Viv wasn't involved in the first three tours, and and, and the scaffold was Roger McGough, Mike Mike McGear, Mike McCartney, and John Gorman. You see, they were known as the scaffold, and the bonzers right. and the scaffold kept bumping into each other. And we said we must do something at some point, and so it turned into this. Uh, very loose kind of uh, thing called Grimm's. And when people like Zoot Money were in there, we, we had, uh, well, John Halsey drummed on it. And uh, uh, lots of people came and went. But uh, Adrian Henry and Brian Patton. So we had basically music, poetry, and comedy. And we didn't really know how it would work. I mean, we just sat on long tables with pints of beer and people just got up and did, <laughs> did things. And it, and it, and, but it worked. It mm. kind of worked in a way because it wasn't showbiz, but it was something to laugh at and something to think about. And I think that's really where we all are. And, and we're right back to, you know, where, you know, that's why we're all close to the Beatles because they can, they can make you laugh and give you something to think about. Mm -hmm. and, and throw in a few good catchy tunes as well, I suppose. <laughs> I, I, I could ask a ton more. I mean, I, I'll leave the Magical Mystery Tour question to somebody else, but I want to ask, when Cheese and Onions got bootlegged as a Lennon track, what did you think of that? <laughs> oh, that was priceless because, um, what is it called? The NME, the New Musical Express. And uh, I think I was the first one to say, well, never underestimate the NME. But... Uh, <laughs> But they, they rang me up and said, Mr. Innes, there's a bootleg Beatle album out there with one of the Rattle songs on it. What have you got to say for yourself? I said, what, what one is it? You know, and eventually I got them to play it over the phone. I said, that's me. And you <laughs> they got it from Saturday Night Live. Mm. <laughs> so... Um, so that didn't, you know, it didn't stick. But there was... Um, it's a, it, 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 we know what the press is like. They've always been like this. But, I mean, once uh, when, when Oasis brought out a song called Whatever, which is very much like a song of mine called How Sweet to Be an Idiot, <laughs> there was a, a piece in one of the music papers saying, you know, that Neil is to sue Oasis, you know. So I thought, what's this? And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I read on and it said... Neil Linus is to sue Oasis for whatever they said. Well, that's what, or at least that's what we think he's doing, because he rang up and he, and he must have been out seeing his lawyers. <laughs> so that was the basis of, you know, uh, putting a headline in um, and, just, and just sort of saying, well, he must be doing that because he wasn't in when we phoned, <laughs> you know. <laughs> wow. Uh, Ken, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Neil. Okay.
I'm going to bounce around a bit, too. Uh, getting back to the Ruddles, I know you talked about the production side of the music and trying to capture the Beatles that way. But when you're talking about compositions, how difficult is it, or maybe it's not difficult at all, to be as close as you can be to a Beatles song, and yet you put a little twist in there to make it just, you know, it's a song by itself. I mean, you really can't get any closer to help than ouches. Um, no, get up and no, go. Okay. Yeah. Get up and go is very close to to get back. I, I mean, there yeah. are examples like that. Is it easy to do that, or what does it take to make it just a well, little bit different to make it its own song? It's it's the hardest ones to write were the kind of earlier straightforward pop song love songs hmm. because um, hold my hand, you know. And, but I wanted each song to sort of tell a sort of story, you know, sort of, I'm not the kind of guy who likes to play Big Brother, but I've just seen your date outside, he's with another, you know, so we've got something going on. And so, and I must be in love, the first one that we did, you know, for Rutland Weekend Television. It's basically a you're the cream in my coffee, you're the salt in my stew, what I call a list lyric, you know. I feel good, I feel bad, I feel happy, I feel sad, am I enough? Well, I must be in love. You know? Right. So, but the only thing that removed that from the being rather corny thing, completely corny anyway, was the middle age. And again, you know, that didn't really rhyme, and it just went around where the chords wanted to go. And so that sort of, you know, that, that bit worked. And, um, and I, I was never going to be bothered much about... <sighs> Whether, you know, it, it was a, absolutely a certain song I was trying to do or not. I think things roll into one another. And it, well, what was a lot easier was, um, uh, you know, writing the psychedelic things. You know? mm. <laughs> it's, it's much harder to write the, the straightforward love songs. So when you're I doing mean, songs that really more evoke a certain period, I Must Be In Love is like 1963 Beatles. That well, yeah, was more difficult. I, I, I see. I never worked from like, oh, I can't do that then because that wasn't that year. Or you've got to have that guitar. I think you've got to go into the general spirit of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't. I, I certainly didn't analyze anything. As I said, I didn't listen to any Beatles songs. I remembered where I was when certain, you know, songs came up, like "Love Me Do" and there's the mouth organ on it or something. And of course, everybody remembers, you know, all you need is love. So, I mean, that, again, I knew I needed a kind of a different time signature or something. But uh, it was actually, there's a lovely follow up to that. Oasis, uh, Noel Gallagher, was on a television, a big television program called uh, The Sports Personality of the Year. And they did a version of All You Need Is Love. And everybody was on Twitter afterwards saying, do you see what he did at the end there? He went into the ruffles, you know, love is the meaning of life. <laughs> life is the meaning of love. <laughs> wow. And I think absolutely nice one, Noel, because that, that's, that's the true spirit of it, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, we talk about the, the music being so wonderful at the ruffles. You, when you did the raw nasty character your voice sounded so much like john lennon did you practice that at all or did that just come natural to you i mean well, eric idol eric idol didn't sound well when he talked anything like paul mccartney but you sounded just like john lennon at times well yeah i suppose having listened to him he 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 can sing high and he can probably you know laugh a bit, but mostly he was talking down there you know right and I, 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 yeah, I had to work a little bit on the little ease, you know, the Liverpool accent, you know. But little things, you know, like popped into my mind, like, you know, I'd like to own a squadron of tanks. <laughs> you know, it just, you know, I don't know. It was fun. It was a dressing up game. You know? Right. Also, one of my favorite things that I like to bring up about the Ruddles is that the character of Stig doesn't say a word. <laughs> you know, in the in the entire documentary at all no. was was well, that, that you know was that, that Eric was that Eric? No, well, he, yes, but it's sort of, but well, he, he did he did he he often in fact there's a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor which 
you know, when they did the second Ruttles, they could have resurrected that because it must have been printed because it was on the one reel, you know. But the the thing is, it, 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 an hour and a half or something on prime time is an hour twelve. So it's a colossal amount, amount goes in advertising space and whatnot, and kickers and what have you. So you know, Ricky didn't get to say much, but the the joke really was George was known as the quiet one. Right, right. So he was really quiet in the ruffles. But um, there was a lovely um, moment where I think George and Eric were going into the plaza foyer in New York, and who should be walking down the steps with George Martin. And uh, he says, oh, hello, Eric. And what's up? And they're talking away, whatever. And then sort of uh, George says, hey, remember me? I'm the quiet one. <laughs> 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 oh, gosh, didn't see you there. Yeah. Going back to the Bonzos, were there any other bands at all in England that did what they did? Were you one well, of a kind? Uh, and what kind of a following following did you have well this is it um we we were all at different art schools and we used to rehearse at the royal college of art every week in the canteen in the evening and the music in most of the pubs on that day was trad jazz traditional jazz and there'd been an outfit called the alberts who had put on an evening at shepherd's bush theater called An Evening of British Rubbish. Um, <laughs> Professor Bruce Lacey, also an arts school teacher, had got a cannon, you know, he got himself in and there was an almighty bang and he threw a dummy out, you know. And then Dougie Gray, one of the Alberts, um, would, would be in a full kilt and bagpipes. Uh, and they had a great big eight-foot-tall cylinder of the painting of the Scottish Highlanders, Highlands on a drum and they'd spin this and he'd walk up and down on the on the spot you know there were lots of visual gags and we thought this is fun and not only that you could get all these silly old uniforms and things in the, in the kind of rag and bone shops of which there were many and so along with the silly 78s and whatever we decided to start playing in pubs and pass the hat round to earn a bit of money that, mm. and this just took off it really, really took off. We ended up playing about five pubs a week and uh, and getting really quite a reputation. So we, 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 when we left art school, we sort of went on the road for six weeks to see if we liked it. And that ended up with another six weeks booking. And the whole sorry tale is we didn't have a holiday in five years. <laughs> we did how many albums and, and, and TV shows and goodness knows what. But we were hanging off the ceiling at the end. We were absolutely burnt out. Yeah. And I think the idea to stop the Bonzers uh, was the right one because, you know, it, when, it, when it was going, it was really very special. And, and we shouldn't have gone on, you know, when we hadn't got any, when we stopped arguing. Sorry, it's a moment of sadness passed over me there. But, uh, <laughs> no. but did, you, did you get airplay, apart from uh, I'm the Urban Spaceman, did you get airplay in England? Um, sort of, yes. I mean, um, the, but we, we weren't like a regular band, you know. Um, Obviously. <laughs> we, we, in fact, we probably hold the record for being the most highly paid band in the country without a hit record <laughs> because people came to see us, you know. Right. And, um, and, and, and that's, you know, the, you know, because of Urban Spaceman, you know, it's wonderful, but, you know, no one knew... Uh, anything about Paul being involved in it and it got to about number 17 on its own and then somebody blabbed and, and it shot up to number 5 but it, it never got to number 1 in England but it sold a really a lot of records well over you know getting on towards half a million um, and we were on top of the pops which is you know the flagship popular music show of the day and uh, four times uh, the fourth time we were getting stuck for a, a visual idea and so we decided to do a parody of a, another program which has sort of come back as it was called come dancing then but it was people in evening dress and, and, and ladies in ball gowns with lots of sequins and everything else like that so half of us were in drag and the other half were in evening dress 
but with uh, no trousers, just boxer shorts <laughs> and, and numbers on our back. And it's funny because Marmalade were number one with Oobla D, Oobla Da. And right. they'd, they'd let it be known in the music press that if they got to number one, they would wear their kilts on top of the pops. <laughs> so <laughs> this is more, we weren't thinking about it, but we were sort of getting ready and all that. And there's a knock on the door. I said, come in. And then in jumped, you know, Marmalade going, ta-da, oh, shit. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> there were all the kilts and things like that, and the bonzers just looked utterly ridiculous. You know, so, yeah. but I mean, who can you know who could not look back on those days and say, well, this is the way to have fun. You know, and I, I you know, you couldn't you couldn't have wanted to be a young in a in a in a better place than London in the late sixties. Mm-hmm. And also, you did tour the U.S. for a couple of tours. Well, yeah, we were there that the year the every British band was in America that year, 69, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, managers were sort of bare fist fights, you know, to get the gigs. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And we, we played at the Fillmore East. And Bill Graham I said, I've got to get you out west. I just haven't got the money. I can fly you out there, but I can't pay you a fee. You don't. We said, don't worry, Bill, it's going to be fine. You know, we have to do it because it's such a legendary venue. And we, we turned up you know, on the day, and the, I, I think Joe Cocker was on, Jefferson Airplane, Pacific Gap, Electric, the Birds. It was, just you name it, they were, everyone was there. And the audience were kind of lying around the floor in a kind of cool way. You know, and they're all wearing these kind of goat's skin, kind of embroidered mirror waistcoat things. So yeah. they, you know, and long hair. So it looked like a, a load of, embro- a herd of embroidered goats lying around the floor. You know, people going around saying uppers, downers, diagonals, whatever. And in those days, our, our act was, you know, it's about 20 minutes polished rubbish, you know. And um, we'd start off with a thing called We Are Normal and We Want Our Freedom. And Roger Spear would have this striped T-shirt with a long chimney, matching striped chimney on his head with a very long false arm and a very long-necked false guitar on elastic. And he'd be playing this thing, and at a certain point his head would explode. And an arm would come Vivian in his gold lame suit and start singing blue suede shoes. You know, and so it's a one for the money, two for the shoes. And we launch into this thing. And at a certain point, we'd all mime. The music would stop. And we'd be all frantically you know, doing this. And <laughs> Viv would be wondering what on earth was going on. Find something to kick. And when we saw him kick, we all started playing again. So anyway, this goes on and whatever. And... Uh, and at the end, what was wonderful is that all these people who had been lying on the floor, apparently stoned, were far from stoned. They were all <laughs> leaping up and down at the end saying, bring them back, Bill. It was lovely. <laughs> you had an appreciative audience there. Absolutely. Um, how did you get involved with Magical Mystery Tour? How did that all come about? I think that's Mike McGear, Mike McCartney. He said he suggested to Paul, why don't you get the bonzos in? And we only just managed it with the skin of our teeth because uh, we were so busy. And it was one day we could go down to that coincided with their schedule. And uh, so we, we did the strip club scene. And that took a day. And that was fun because uh, John and, and Ringo had their own little movie cameras, little clockwork Bolex 16 millimeter. Thing. And I said, I said, well, what are you doing? He said, we're doing the Weybridge version. <laughs> you know? And um, so that everyone was mocking in. And George said, you know, Death Cab for Cutie should be a, a single. And it, it was just sort of another day in the life of Bonzos on the road, if you like. But the Bar- Beatles used to come and see us, you know, like at the Savile and whatnot. And um, in the days when they used to wear false beards and things. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we had the party for Mas- Magical Mystery Tour, there was much, much jollity. And I think the Beach Boys were there, and we ended up playing a version of O Carol for 20 minutes. But 
<laughs> Larry, Larry got up to do, and John was dressed in a, like a teddy boy with his hair all slicked back. And um, we got to a point where Larry was going to come out and tap dance on butter, button up your overcoat. And he had these kind of plastic false breasts, you know, and, and well, put it this way, John knew what was coming. He said, come on, Larry, show us your tits. We've all seen them. <laughs> <laughs> How does it make you feel to know that there's a band out there? It's been around for, well, since uh, I think it's about 20 years, called Death Cab for Cutie, which oh, has gotten quite, wonderful. quite a, you know, a following. And yes, uh, I, I, I love I, that band myself. So, yeah, no, it, it's great. I saw them in uh, in the UK. They they played a festival, and uh, I've never spoken to them or anything about. It, but it's one of those names, you know. I found I found that name. Um, when I was out looking for old 78 records and things like that, there were some comics, true crime comics, and American in origin too. And the this one had a cover that said Death Cab for Cutie. And underneath it, which is the one that really got my eye, was the other story was it was a great party until somebody found a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Viv agreed that Death Cab for Cutie was a great title. I mean, it was one of the few songs we actually wrote in the room together. But we did on that one. And we did actually do a version of something called It Was a Great Party Until Somebody Found a Hammer. We did it live at the Marquee. And we invested in all these cheap, broken saxophones and handed them out to the audience. And so the whole the whole place was sort of like blowing a kind of riff. da 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 you know, it was a great party until somebody found a hammer, 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 yeah. You know, it was <laughs> monstrous. I'm, I'm, I'm probably relieved that the, the recording doesn't exist, but maybe someone's got one somewhere, but it's, uh, it's uh, probably a, 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 an open wound. <laughs> All right, uh, Alan, how about some more questions? Uh, sure. Um, you know, in, in Magical Mystery Tour, when they were making that, they also got a clip from Traffic, and they filmed Ivor Cutler singing a song on his own. But of those non-Beatles things, the only one that actually remained was the Bonzos. Um, do you have any insight into why you guys survived and those other clips didn't? Because um, we were with the stripper. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in no, fact, because, I mean, you talk you talk about Tony Palmer <laughs> and things like that. He, I mean, he he was not averse to having the odd stripper or nude popping up as, as art, you know. <laughs> and uh, I've I've always liked the film, you know, being an art student. It's a kind of art student movie, um, and so, but to show it on black and white television, <laughs> you know, when they did was, you know, it, it baffled a lot of people, you know, who hadn't had an art school and entertainment uh, education and hadn't heard of Louis Bunuel or anyone like that, or the Surrealists and things like that. So it, it was, it, yeah, I think that's why the Bonzo survived, because we had a stripper. But even so, when the bra came off, they put a nice black rectangle over her boobs. Yes. So the... Nobody on the BBC homes would be uh, offended. S scandalized, <laughs> right. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, there's um, actually recently been some bootleg DVDs of outtakes for Magical Mystery Tour in which that scene is shown without the black bar. And ah. uh, you'll be happy to know. And last week when we were talking about um, this interview with you today, um, my colleagues... Uh, uh, dared me to ask you um, how distracting it was doing that song with Shirley there. <laughs> well, I love the way you I love the way you phrase that. <laughs> uh, you see, art students are completely used to nudity. We do it twice a week at the life oh, class. Oh, right, you know? of course. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> apart from that, it's a, Viv had to sort of work much harder. You know. The, the, react to the two of them, you know, because he used to do this incredibly funny striptease mime. And um, so that was all part of it. And everyone sort of, a lot of rules are broken, you know, because a lot of movie makers, the classic movie making mistake is everybody knows the script 
And they don't remember that sometimes the finished thing, people don't know that script, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a little sloppy in many ways, but it, it, it had a great feel, the, 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 the fun of it. And we got all our toys out and we had these masks, you know, we did backing singers and, and what have you. So it was just a fun day, mm -hmm. very, very, very much a fun day. And Paul was really nice to me because he'd heard um, the Gorilla album and I, I got an instrumental thing on there called Music for the Head Ballet. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, I really, really like that. You know, he didn't have to say that, but I, it's, it's kind of nice because it is a bit of off-the-wall music, you know. Mm -hmm. So the day that you guys filmed your bit, um, were, was there other filming going on uh, at other times during that same day that you were able to sort of watch? No, no, it was a totally in there all day, you oh. know, because, you know, to get, what is it, three or four minutes of of, of stuff, that's a, that's a full day, you know, mm -hmm. ratio of 12 to 1, you know, whatever they were shooting on. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Ivor Cutler, back to Ivor Cutler, what a sweet man. Mm -hmm. He was on the bus all the time, you know, but um, we, I did a gig with him once at a, at a university somewhere. We got to chatting. And months, months, and months later, or even years later, I was walking on the south bank of the Thames, where all the art galleries and bits and pieces are. And then I see this, this figure on a bicycle with a yellow cycle cape, wobbling along and I think it's Ivor you know so I thought well I, I didn't jump out at him because he would have fallen off you know but I sort of eased my way into his line of view and said hello Ivor and he goes oh it's you and, uh, and then <laughs> we, had, we shared a few bit and he, he reached into his pocket and he had two little rolls of stickers they were tiniest stickers you can imagine and one of them said no with an exclamation mark. <laughs> and the other one said, slightly imperfect. <laughs> and he gave me four, gave me four of each. <laughs> I think he's a, he's a wonderful man. And he, he used to say, what is it? Shoes with thin soles tell us more about the world we walk upon than shoes with thick soles. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he did a, a bunch of albums for, I think, Virgin in its early days that are probably not sufficiently known in the U.S., but they are hilarious. You yeah, know. no, he's wonderful. It's, he is slow burn. It's all there. Lovely. Yeah. Um, so one more um, Ruddles question, which is uh, just that, did it surprise you the longevity that thing has had? I mean, we're still talking about it now, and it's decades later, 40 years or so. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, it, it, yes, of course it does. I mean, because I thought, you know, it was over and done after that one thing in Rutland Weekend Television. But then, you know, it goes on and on. And uh, it's, it's lovely because we, we're, we're going to do a tour in May again in the UK. And, um, and I'm very happy to be playing the cutting room with, you know, Drew Hill and um, and then Burtnick and, uh, and and Rutling Ken on the guitar. We're going to be calling ourselves the, the fake Ruttles. <laughs> but um, Drew is, the, 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 the four of them do, you know, Day in the Life, live, you know. And Drew told me a funny story once, you know, he said, Drew was once interviewed about, you know, I said, what's it like being in a tribute band, you know? Playing somewhere else, he said, "Well, it's a little like being in the New York Philharmonic." You know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's perfectly true. You know, good music. You know, you, you play it. So I'm really, I'm really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm also in the writing of Archaeology, the second album, which we, the, 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 how that came about and all that sort of thing, is um, a rattling Ken. You know. I can't keep things. I never know where anything is. But he said, Maz mentioned that he's, he'd got copies of the, the demos we made um, for archaeology. And, and I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it together. I'm putting together a third and final uh, Ruttle thing called the Wheat Album. Ooh. <laughs> and it's got some extra tracks, but mostly 
the demos from archaeology. And they've got a certain, demos have always got a certain je ne sais quoi. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's kind of like stripped down uh, ruffles. Uh, but I've, I've had some fun with uh, with some sound effects and things like that. And there is a kind of a narrative arc. And it's funny how, even though these songs are 20 years old, you know, they've come of age in a way. You know, things like Anna Klein and middle class of music. And, right. <laughs> In Shangri La, hello there today, you know, and so I, I feel you know that this is worth you know putting out. I also did something a while back called um, them. It's a it's it's a sort of poem um, about evolution, and uh, so I thought, well, if we're calling it the Wheat Album, <laughs> I, I put I put some humpback whales and some. See and sound effects and what have you to this track, and introduce the voice going number ten, number <laughs> ten, number <laughs> ten. And uh, it, it, but it actually it works really quite well, mm. and it's evolution number ten. Yeah. And um, so you see, Spinal Tap may have gone to eleven, but the Russells went to number ten. <laughs> Looking forward to that. You can use for the. With the demos in, in that certain je ne sais quoi, you can um, steal the Beatles' old advertising line for Get Back and say the Ruddles is nature intended. You know. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I'm, well, I'm also, you know, the looking around for crop circles you know, for the cover. <laughs> but um, it's, also, there's the, the use your ears, ears of wheat. There's a lot of, anyway, but I, I will <laughs> hand it over to someone who is far more measured in their, <laughs> their look. But it will be a white album, you know, with... Uh, with when, uh, when's, that, I, when's that going to happen, Neil? I hope it'll be ready the end of April. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, because um, Steve James, who, you know, worked on the first album, worked on, you know, the Innis Book of Records on BBC Two, and worked on archaeology. You know, we've kept in contact over the years, but he's in Australia at the moment. But we've we kept uh, tapping the table and sending the postcards, and uh, so he's actually mastering it at the moment. So it's lovely to have him back on it. And I also got plans for a new solo album this year. I've got more than enough songs because I moved house. I moved to France, and so two years of sort of like trying to sort out and I haven't done much, but I've been writing on, you know, in between hanging up pictures and digging holes for trees. And, um, and I've got more than enough. I just, uh, so it, it, we're going to try and make that later in the year, this year. So, but Steve's coming over from Australia to, to hold my hand. Is that where you, is that where you're calling from now, France? Yes. Okay. Alan, can I, can I oh, go absolutely. ahead? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause... Okay. Uh, I just had two questions. Um, number one, you mentioned Ivor Cutler and, and your your impressions of him. Are, are there any other cast members from Magical Mystery Tour that you remember well, or you know that? Have well, any... you've got to remember we only did the one day. We never went on the bus. Okay. Um, so we didn't get to bump into them. But I I, I wasn't aware that uh, traffic were, were uh, in the the thing because we knew them very well too. I remember somewhere we were playing, sitting in the dressing room, just talking to Stevie, you know, and somebody said, Stevie, you were on, you know, he said, oh, he said, oh, and he got up and we said, well, have a good one. So sort of thing. he said, oh, hang on, I better put my stage gear on. And he reached into his jacket pocket and brought out a, a string of beads. And, put them on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and given the fact that you, that you're doing another um, Rettles project this year, how are the is the uh, are the feelings are the is, is the relationship between you and Eric? Because we've heard rumors that that there have been up and downs. Is it is it back to being good again? Are you guys getting along? Well, I I I, I don't know. I because I mean, I found out by accident. Danny Farrington, who makes wonderful ukuleles, did something, and I was going to sort of join in the conversation, and I needed to find that Eric had blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> Wow. So I I don't know what I've done wrong, probably just existing at the moment. But um, no, I, Eric got very proprietorial about the Ruttles and had to be reminded that it wasn't entirely his idea. <laughs> so, you know, 
it's one of those things. But, you know, as, as Benjamin Disraeli said, you know, life is too short to be small. And, I'm, I, and I don't, you know, I don't do Olympic uh, grudge bearing, you know. Mm. Okay. So I, you know, it's just one of those things. But I, I, all the other Python boys I see regularly, you know, well, Terry not so much, poor boy. And, uh, and then Graham not at all. <laughs> <laughs> For obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, yeah. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and power to you. May your podcast go from strength to strength. Thank you. Uh, Neil, thanks so much. Thanks, Neil. My pleasure, guys. I'll see you you tomorrow. Okay. 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 Bye. 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 All right. So, Neil Innes, what a great guest to have here in the studio on Skype. <laughs> uh, and as you know, we could have gone on much longer. There's so many things that we wanted to talk about. I'm actually going to be interviewing him tomorrow, the day after this interview. So uh, there'll be more for people, for you folks to listen to uh, in conversation with Neil Innes. Uh, why don't we give the folks our contact information now? How about you, Steve? Um, Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. And you can um, catch me on my Beatles news page, Beatles news and information, and of course there's a there's a, a page for this sh- for this show, things we said today, Beatles radio fans. You can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We're on Twitter at things we said fab, and you can it ca- download the show on Podbean, on YouTube, on uh, and you can hear us on TuneIn Radio. There we go. Sorry. All right, that's okay. We, we can plug ourselves, and, and the list is growing longer where people can reach us. So, um, Alan, how about you? Yeah, the best way to get me is on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. All right. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Also on my Facebook page for Ken Michaels. And then there's my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. As I always say every week, there's weekly trivia on my website where you can win one of nine great prizes. I now have the brand new remastered Goodnight Vienna on vinyl to give away from the folks at Universal. And um, so that will be one of the nine prizes that you can win on my website. And in addition to that, for those of you who like great songwriters... I actually have a pair of tickets to give away on my website to see the legendary Jimmy Webb in concert. Are either of you Jimmy Webb fans? Someone left the cake out in the rain. Actually, yeah, I have it. I, I, I got to put that uh, back on my uh, on my uh, iPhone. I do like that. I do like that album. I have to admit. Sorry. What the Richard Harris album? Yes, I do. Yes. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, Jimmy Webb's written so many great classics, especially for Glenn Campbell. But um, he's going to be uh, at Infinity Music Hall in Hartford on March the 22nd. So if you live in the New York, New England area, you want to win a pair of tickets, it's the easiest thing to win just by following the instructions on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I just want to quickly mention, since we did it at the beginning of the show with Neil, if you want to see him in person, he'll be at the Fest for Beatle Fans at the Hyatt Regency, Jersey City on the Hudson, March 9th, 10th, and 11th. Also at the Cutting Room in New York City, March 13th, and the Vault in Berlin, New Jersey, March the 14th. All right, this has been an incredible show, having Neil as our guest. Thanks so much for tuning in, and for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, and Neil Innes, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Next time.